So um, thank you so much for coming. Uh, thank you to Lucinda and Julian for hosting tonight. Um, it's a privilege to, to speak. Um, it's quite strange on Zoom, kind of speaking in your own house um, with people on cameras and stuff, but um, hopefully ask some good questions at the end to kind of chat through things. <clears throat> Please do also put some questions in and comments in the chat as well. And we can talk through those things um, later and that should be good. Um, so let me just go to the next slide. So this evening, the plan is to um, inspire an interest in fungi. I'm sure that some of you already do have an interest because you're here this evening to listen to some and see some nice photos of fungi. Not listen to fungi, that's not quite something you can do just yet, I don't think. Um, but also understand where fungi live um, everywhere, laughing out loud. They, they are literally everywhere. Um, and obviously not mushrooms growing everywhere. There's, some do um, grow in your house, but fungi is everywhere and it's a key part of life. Um, I'm going to give some tips at the end just on how to identify common species. So some of the ones you might be able to find in your garden, if you have, if you're lucky enough to have one in your park, in a local park or in the woods or something like that. Some also some quite surprising places where you can find mushrooms as well. And also just encourage conservation. So that could be, <coughs> excuse me, you could be looking to support um, a local volunteer group, um, you know, in some woodland management or something like that, or you could donate to a conservation charity or just um, raise awareness and campaign for fungi, which is something I'm sure which is, is coming along in the future. Um, so just to go through the terminology that I'm going to be using, I'm talking, when I talk about fungi, I'm talking about the kingdom of fungi. And this is alongside the kingdom of animals and also plants. I think there's some other kingdoms of, as well, because bacteria are also another, another form of life. Um, but fungi were only confirmed um, in their own kingdom in 1969. And I think the first record, that, the kind of furthest record back that fungi go in the fossil record is something like 800 million to 1 billion years. So they've been waiting quite a long time to be properly recognized as their own, their own crew. Um, when I talk about mycology, I'm talking about the study of fungi. I don't talk about that too much. Uh, just to say that I'm not a mycologist. Um, I, I kind of work in volunteering um, in the environmental sector. So I'm, I'm not a scientist. I do, have done a lot of um, species monitoring um, in a previous role. And I also do sort of micro volunteering submitting species records to things like iNaturalist and stuff like that. Um, but a mycologist is someone who professionally studies fungi. Um, when we talk about, I generally just call things mushrooms. I don't ever use the word toadstools. Um, that's, it's only really a phrase that you hear people using who are kind of coming to it, coming to fungi with curiosity, maybe for the first time. It's quite an old, I think it's an Anglo-Saxon word. Um, it's got quite an interesting definition, but I haven't managed to remember it or put it in here. But when we talk about mushrooms, I'm talking about your typical mushroom with a what you call a stipe, um, or usually known as a stem, um, and also has a cap on it and gills, but it's a lot more complicated um, than that. And I sometimes just call them shrooms because it's a bit shorter. When I say shrooms, I'm not talking about psychedelic substances, just to clear that up. Um, and slime molds are often put together with fungi, but they're not actually, they're not the same. Um, slime molds are thought to be animals, more closer to animals than to fungi. So completely different kingdom, but they they do like the same habitats and they do have they do seem to have similar sort of behaviour. So um, it's very easy to confuse them. And there's something like I, I don't know how many species of slime molds in the UK, but in 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 the world, I think there's something like a hundred thousand species of fungi have been identified or something. But they think there's um, several million species to be identified eventually. Um, so I thought I'd just start by talking about some of the books that will help you with identification. Um, I've got some of them here to show you. So this is the first one I've got, just to show you the size of the book. Um, this is the Collins Complete Guide to British Mushrooms and Toadstools. Um, this is good because it has, has photos. Some people prefer drawings and these sorts of things, but I think photos can be a good way to get started. Um, so this is a book, costs about 15 to 20 pounds. I don't know if it's got a newer, newer version on it yet, um, but it's a really good book to start with. So I'd recommend that one. Um, then there's Roger Phillips' Mushrooms, which is one of the, the favourite books of people who are particularly looking to eat mushrooms. Um, and it's good because it has pictures of mushrooms in different stages. So it's got the mushrooms when they're younger, but also when they're um, a bit older, should we say, and also when they're looking a bit worse for wear. So this is a really, really great book, Mushrooms by Roger Phillips. 
Um, and then we, I've got my microphone right on top of this one, but I'm gonna to have to carefully move it just to show you. So the, this is a series of two books, which are absolutely huge. Um, and they retail about a hundred um, British pounds. Um, it's, this book is absolutely amazing. The, the quality of the photos in it is just amazing. And the, the range of species that they cover, it's got bog beacon on the front cover, which is actually something you get in the UK, uh, you get it in puddles in Sussex, apparently near me, but I haven't actually found it yet. Um, but that is a really great book, but that's maybe further down the, the line of your, your journey in, of understanding fungi. Um, but those come as a, as a pair. Um, if you're looking to kind of read more into the science writing, you could, um, I'm sure some of you have already read this and probably know a bit, but this is Entangled Life by Merlin Sheldrake. Um, not sure if anyone's read that. <clears throat> I actually bought it um, and I tried to, <laughs> tried to read it, but it's just so, it's just quite dense. And, and I kind of, I don't know if I'm kind of in the place at the moment, still in the pandemic, not sure I can really take in too much information in my spare time at the moment. Um, but I know that it's a critically acclaimed book and he is a uh, very intelligent, intelligent, I think he's a professor or something now, or um, he, he studies or he works at Oxford or Cambridge, I can't remember where. Um, but it, some of the information in that book is just mind blowing. It's just there's so much of it in there to take in. Um, this is a really nice entry book um, that I'd recommend, which is Mushrooms by Peter Marin. Um, and he writes a lot about foraging and in quite positive ways. And he's often writes in defense of foraging mushrooms for, to eat because um, a lot of people are not so keen on, on that happening. Um, but this is a really good book with lots of interesting stories um, about the early kind of mycologists and stuff like that. Um, but just some amazing simple facts about fungi and it's a really nice book and it's got nice photos in it. That's a, that's a hardback, but it's not as big as the, the big fungi of temperate Europe books. Um, if you're looking for something cheap, you could get the Mushrooms and Toadstools, um, Collins New Naturalist, um, which you can get on eBay for a couple of quid. Um, this will be one of, the, one of the older ones. If you get the ones that were brought out in the 1980s, they're often about a pound or something. And again, I mean, it's, it's well out of date now, um, but it's still really interesting um, and it still will teach you some of the basics about fungi if you're not looking to spend too much money on a book. Um, and just to promote a book by someone, um, look, a female writer, can you believe that in, in nature writing, which is dominated by men? Um, it's really good to see. Um, this is a book that's just come out, Secret Life of Fungi, Discoveries from a Hidden World. And that's quite short as well. So um, I've actually got the ebook of that, but I haven't, I've started it, but it seems good. And um, that might be a, a good way to start as well. Um, and yeah, so Lucinda mentioned how I've got a podcast. Um, one of the ones I really like is uh, Welcome to the Mushroom Hour, um, which I think is, is an American um, podcaster. But that's a really good, um, good listen. And he posts maybe like once every two weeks or something. And he has all of the um, mushroom celebrities that you get. And there's a lot of them in the US. You'd be surprised um, on Instagram and stuff like that. There's very, very popular mushroom people. Um, when I say mushroom people, they're not like half mushroom, half person. You know, I think you know what I'm saying. Um, this is a film, The Mushroom Movie, Fantastic Fungi, which you can um, stream, but you have to pay about £10, I think. Um, you can stream it off the website or you can do it through, you know, some of these streaming services. Not, it's not on Netflix. I, I got it through Apple TV, I think. And that's the main reason I actually got that so I could watch this. But this is an amazing um, sort of visual achievement because of the quality of the... Um, the slow, slow footage, what you call it, the time-lapse footage of mushrooms appearing from the ground and then disappearing and then being eaten by the things. A lot of the film is covered by, is about Paul Stamets, who's a, um, a mycologist in the US, who you may know about because he has a famous TED talk, um, but I'd really recommend uh, that. Um, so for those of you who aren't local to South London, you might not, this might be complete, not make much sense to you really, um, but, I used to work at Sydenham Hill Woods um, for London Wildlife Trust and I was the conservation officer there and that is where I got into fungi. That's where I started to um, get an interest in it. Um, and I used to I used to lead these walks um, in person, as you can see here. This is quite a funny photo and I just I thought I'd just illustrate it just to to you know have a bit of fun with it because um, the people look really disappointed and quite unhappy <laughs> with, with the walk. But fungi walks are very popular. Um, we used to have to cap their numbers um, about kind of 30 because we used to have 50 to 100 people showing up 
and you can see there it's not a particularly big woodland and slim pathway so um but yeah that, that's that's where i kind of started was leading fungi walks anyway and they weren't for it they weren't kind of culinary foraging walks it was talking about the ecology and it's a bit similar to this really um but i'm in sussex now this is a view um of the Sussex Weald, which is one of the biggest areas. I think it's the, the most wooded area in the whole of the UK. Um, <clears throat> and it's kind of near, it goes towards Rye and then comes all the way over to um, near Horsham and West Sussex and features famous places like Ashdown Forest and stuff like that. Uh, in the distance in this photo, you can see the South Downs. Um, but yeah, I, I moved here about three years ago and I don't really kind of know that many mushroom, in, mushroom folk around here. So, a lot of the interaction I have with people is through the hashtag Fungi Friday on um, social media sites such as Twitter. It's a nice place. Um, there's loads of mushrooms in there, in that woodland down there. Um, but one of the low wheeled woodlands, which I like to visit where possible, I'm trying not to drive so much. Um, I don't really like driving and obviously it's not very good environmentally. It's not good for fungi either because it releases um, nitrogen. Um, I think nitrogen dioxide, which is not very good for fungi and alters the kind of soil chemistry and stuff like that, which is not good for fungi. But when I, I do go to this place in the autumn, this is a Sussex Wildlife Trust Nature Reserve, a National Nature Reserve, Evano Common. I mean, this is what you find there. This is a, a, a large dead beech tree. Um, Fagus sylvatica is the, that's the name of the tree. And it's got loads of species of very large fungus on it. At least two of them are edible. Um, but I got into fungi through volunteering. And so these are my, I think it's one of my earliest attempts at taking a photo of a mushroom. So I thought I'd show you the one where it goes wrong, um, just so you can see also what I was trying to get a photo of. Um, but yeah, that was in 2011, I think, um, when I was a volunteer, just after the volunteer work day. Um, and that is a uh, velvet shank uh, mushroom. Um, so the places that you need to go to find fungi, um, the best place you can go to is a woodland. So this is Ebeno Common once more, um, with a big dead tree that's fallen down. Um, lots of beech trees around there. You can see some fallen dead woods. The, the best, best woods for fungi are the are ancient woodlands in the UK. Um, so they're ones that have been wooded for more than 400 years. Uh, so since the 1600s. Um, and they have stable soil conditions, but also they have quite rich um, floral diversity, which is important in the range of species you have, which we'll cover. So the woods is always going to be your best bet. But I, I, I must say that, you know, if you're going to an urban woodland, someone like Sydenham Hill Wood or any of your urban woodlands near where you live, um, you do have to be careful not to trample too much because um, I know that somewhere like Sydenham Hill Wood has something like 300,000 visitors every year or visits every year and our feet, you know, they do make an impact. So I really try not to go too often to sensitive places and you always have to be careful about where you're stepping because um, compaction in woodlands is very damaging. Um, but there's lots of great woodlands that you can visit. Um, so this is um, an ancient oak tree. This tree is a thousand years old. This is um, near Midhurst in West Sussex. This is the Queen Elizabeth Oak. Um, a lot of oak trees get called Queen Elizabeth Oak because the, one, the Queen Elizabeth is supposed to have sat underneath it. Trees. Um, you also get the Royal Oak as well. Um, but this tree, veteran trees and ancient trees are particularly good for fungi. Um, because they have a lot of decaying wood, they've got long-standing um, relationships with fungi in the soil and other things around them. Um, and this tree in particular has the beefsteak fungus, which I've completely forgotten to put in this talk, which is a red fungus that looks like human organs, um, but it's completely covered with them in the autumn. Um, and that, that'll be a, a relationship that's been, been going on for quite a long time. Um, this is a picture on the South Circular in uh, near the Horniman Museum in... Uh, Forest Hill in South East London. Um, and this is an oyster fungus, or oyster mushroom, which is actually an, an edible species. So this is the one that you often get in, in the supermarket, but you can also get them to grow your own as well. Um, but I love this because you've got this, this, this um, stump here with these mushrooms just bursting out of them. And in the background, you've got cars traveling along, um, but they fungi will grow in urban environments that do, do grow in cities. But what we're really seeing here is the fruiting body. So the, the fungus is much more than that, but fruiting bodies will appear in all sorts of places. This is possibly my favorite, favorite um, urban fungus find. Um, this is fairy ink cap, as we call it in the UK. I'm saying the UK because I'm not sure if everyone here is, from, is in the UK, so you might have different names. And some of the names might be regional anyway in the UK. I think there's someone from the Lake Districts. So you might call it something completely different. 
Um, but this was in the steps of Clapham Junction, um, which, is, which was once the busiest railway station in the whole of the world. Um, not anymore, I don't think. Um, but yeah, these mushrooms were just growing in a step and I was really delighted to get a picture of them. But they're just producing spores. There's a nice little damp corner there. The spores have got into that corner and then produce the fruiting body eventually. Um, so this is also near, this is in Forest Hill again. <laughs> I was just walking past um, when I used to work in Sydney Hill Wood, I was on my way there one morning and this um, house had had the garden completely redone and they'd taken out all of the plants in the front. That's something that always kind of makes me grumble <laughs> um, because, you know, you want to see um, plants and things, don't you? Um, but this massive group of sulfur tuft mushrooms had just burst out of the ground after some rain um, and I thought it was quite a defiant response from those mushrooms, so it was really nice to see. Um, cemeteries are really good places to find grassland species of fungi. Um, I know in London there's a lot of cemeteries that are managed very um, sensitively for wildlife. There's lots of um, fallen trees that are left to remain and stuff like that and, and break down and, and fungi will, will fruit from those trees. Um, but here I'm not sure if you can spot the fungus. It's quite, um, quite incongruous perhaps. I'll just give you a second, see if you can find it. Yeah, it's there. So this is a meadow wax cap. Um, I think it's probably been messed with by the frost, um, which has made it go over so um, dramatically, but it's quite, it looks like an orange tree, like a tree of fire or something, doesn't it? Um, but this is, wax caps are rare mushrooms because um, they usually are found in ancient grasslands and most grasslands, you might have heard that st statistic trumpeted again and again that 97% um, of, of, of wildflower meadows have been lost in in the UK um, since the Second World War, and that's why we've also lost wax caps, so they're very important. You don't really get them in woodlands. Um, and of course, dung. So this is in the New Forest. Um, there's lots of free roaming herbivores in the New Forest, so um, cattle, horses, ponies, um, wild pigs and stuff. And this is, cool, this is quite a cool mushroom. I forget the name of it, but the Latin name I think is Paneolus. Um, but yeah, I was quite pleased to find that. Um, so just talking about the ecology of fungi um, and how it all works, I'm not sure if anyone has heard of the phrase the wood wide web. Um, it seems to be quite fashionable nowadays. It's, um, it's such an amazing, amazing concept that it has broken through in definitely in the UK into the mainstream media. Um, and I think Radio 4, uh, BBC Radio 4 have something about it most weeks now. Um, but this is what this is the wood wide web here. So you've got um, the tree with the roots in the ground connecting up with the mycelia, um, the singular is mycelium of uh, mushrooms and fungi. Um, so we've got the fruiting body is the mushroom. So it's like the, the apple on the tree, should we say, that you usually see above ground. Um, many species of fungus don't actually ever produce fruiting bodies and you'd never see them. So that's what I mean when I say that they're everywhere, you just don't notice them. Um, then you've got the mycelium, which we mentioned, which is linked up with the fungus, the tree roots will collect, will um, link up with the, the mycelium and the tree roots are able to actually send the mycelium off in different directions um, to actually find things that they cannot get on their own. So that's what you call a symbiotic relationship. I believe the tree will be providing water to the fungus. Um, the fun a fungal fruiting body is something like 90% water. So they need water. That's why you don't get them growing so much in the winter time and also when it's very hot and dry. Um, so the kind of wet season. So right now, for example, in, in uh, Southern England, we've had a lot of rain in the past uh, week. Feels like forever, doesn't it? Um, but I think if you go to the woods in the next few days, you'll start to see some spring species coming up because they're getting, they're getting a drink. Um, but the mycelium is made up of these filaments that are called hyphae. Um, so this is a mushroom that's, that's overturned that I found. Um, and you can see those white filaments, that is the, the mycelium that are made up of the hyphae that are connecting up with um, all sorts of things in the soil. Um, and they're also degrading that soil and drawing the nutrients out of it. Um, and they're breaking down the organic matter. And that's exactly why we have soil. That's why we're not surrounded by um, fallen trees and, and other um, undecayed matter. So if you think about this, you think that trees um, grow only as tall as they do because they have these relationships with fungi and live as long and live as vigorously as they do is because they have these symbiotic relationships. And these symbiotic relationships between plants and fungi 
could go back to the time when plants were not yet on earth, when things were in the water um, under, under the sea, um, to quote a famous Disney film. So this is the, one of the most important ecological relationships on earth and we would not be here without it. And it's also very much threatened if you think about damage being done to woodlands and old, old woodlands in particular. Um, so with the mycelium, you're not really going to see it. So this is the this is what you will see. This is probably the largest patch of fungi I've ever seen. Um, and these are honey fungus, um, a species that has quite a bad reputation because um, it's um, a species that will actually take more than it gives from a tree and sometimes will weaken trees and trees will then die. And of course, people, people don't like that, but it's part of nature. Um, but what you do, what you do sometimes see with honey fungus is where, where it gets its name of boot laces. Um, so this is underneath the bark of an oak tree that's fallen down. It was probably helped on its way by honey fungus. But the, the boot laces, these are also known as rhizomorphs, um, and they grow under, you can see they've grown underneath the bark there, and they're, they're breaking down the tree as well where they can and taking in those nutrients and minerals to then produce the fruiting bodies, which will then spread the spores everywhere. And then that's how you'll get those mushrooms growing in other places. Um, equally important, um, I would say, are lichens. Um, lichens are a, an, an, a very interesting, um, they're kind of like a group of species. They're not actually one standalone thing, really, because they're a symbiotic relationship or a partnership of fungi, which, which creates the, the physical structure. Then you sometimes have a cyanobacteria, which I think in this, this um, sunburst lichen here might be the, the brighter colouring that you're seeing. But you also see, you also have um, some other bacteria, but um, algae as well, because algae and cyanobacteria are able to photosynthesize and turn sunlight into sugar, which can then feed um, the fungus. And the fungus gives the, um, those other life forms a place to live effectively. Um, I've got here a cup fungus. So that's a scarlet elf cup. Um, you, you'd scientifically refer to them as ascomycetes. And the, you can see the cup fungi um, the fruiting body on the, the lichen, that it's the same group or type of fungus um, that is part of a lichen. But there's lots of different types of lichens um, and some of them are quite difficult to identify, but this one's a very common one, which you, you can see quite easily. Um, so are fungi bad? Um, I'll get to the Oscar the Grouch in a bit, but a lot of people are very scared of fungi in, the, in England in particular, there's a lot of mycophobia. Um, so people, um, you know, people can be quite um, fearful of, of fungi and particularly because they can poison you some of them and um, also because fungi will break down trees um, and and break down the roots of trees and sometimes trees will fall and in very very rare cases people will be hurt but actually more people are injured every year by climbing into wheelie bins than they are by trees falling so that's something to bear in mind but are fungi evil you know some people do actually think that about certain things. You, sometimes people approach the natural world looking for 100% answers. Um, fungi aren't evil, they're a part of life. Um, but they're, they're, we have a species in the UK which has been imported um, through the horticultural trade. Um, also, it spreads its own spores, so that it gathers pace that way as well. That's something called ash dieback disease, um, which I'm sure you, you may have heard of already. Uh, this is a view um, towards Eastbourne in the South Downs National Park. Um, and this is a line of ash trees which are um, breaking down and, and dying because they've been infected with ash dieback. Um, and this is something that would be is happening all across the country and has been happening in Europe for 20 years. Um, and the ash has no defence against this. So we are losing ash trees at an alarming rate, a lot of them being cut down alongside the roads because um, they do present a hazard and they fall much more quickly when they are um, in infected with this fungus. So you know, fungi doesn't do everything we want it to do. <clears throat> but it does do some very good things indeed. Um, so fungi is an important um, element of certain med medicines. Fungi are, I should say, I always say fungi is. Fungi are an impor important part of med um, medical development. So um, insulin um, can be made from types of fungus. Um, we've got a picture here on the right of penicillin, of course, which has saved um, millions and millions of lives. I know some people are allergic to it, but it does come from a um, it does come from a fungus. Um, apparently, um, in that Merlin Sheldrake book, one thing I do remember is that Neanderthals, um, an extinct species of human, 
um, were known to chew on a piece of wood um, when they had problems with their teeth and gums. And it was found that that, that um, wood actually had the fungus that now produced, that now are used to make penicillin. So they probably knew what they were doing and maybe discovered it before Homo sapiens did. Um, but also there's a lot of studies into um, psilocybin, which is the compound found in the very typical magic mushroom. Um, so if you watch that film, Fantastic Fungi, um, there's a very moving segment about the way um, the extract is being used to help people who are suffering from terminal illness and to cope with um, people who suffered from post-traumatic stress, stress disorder and stuff like that, um, and to deal with anxiety and depression. So that's something that might be coming um, more kind of mainstream in future, but it is illegal to be in possession of those mushrooms otherwise. So moving on to how to identify fungi, um, you've got to think about the habitat. You've got to think about the time of year. So right now we've probably got in the, uh, Southern England, we've got some uh, spring mushrooms coming out. The one that people want to see at the moment is the morel, um, which looks like a sort of honeycomb. I've never seen one. Um, and I think they're quite difficult to see sometimes. Um, but the time of year is really important as well. So autumn is the best time of year really to find fungi. Um, if you want to look for certain species, you're looking for colour. So chicken of the woods, you've got a photo there. Uh, it's really, you know, unmistakable. It's bright yellow and the fly agaric, um, one of the most iconic mushrooms is bright red with white spots. Um, you're looking for a type of fungus. So I've got four pictures here of different types. You've got the typical mushroom or toadstool and fly agaric. Then you've got coral fungus, um, it's something that grows on fallen wood and does indeed look like coral. Uh, chicken of the woods is a bracket fungus. And then you've got, um, this is a wax cap upturned, which is um, a grass and species, but you can see the gills on it. So sometimes they don't always have gills, they might have pores. There we go. Um, what does the stem or the stipe look like? There's all these different patterns and, and textures that you'll be looking for. And does it have a collar? So um, a lot of the parasol mushrooms have collars and the amanitas, which we'll get to in a minute, they sometimes have a universal veil which they kind of emerge from. It's kind of a sheet that they emerge from. It sounds very so, kind of mystical, doesn't it? And um, it sometimes is then left over as a sort of collar. Um, and if you're really um, into identifying mushrooms, you can look for the spore print. Um, so what you do is you take the cap of a fungus, you put it on a sheet of paper, and you then put a glass or something over the um, mushroom. And then you just so it will release the spores from the gills. Um, and then you take the glass away, you take the fungus away and you'll see it's left a spore print on the paper. And from the color of it, you can actually work out uh, what fungus it is. Um, so just gonna go through some of the, the key fungi that you should be looking for. Um, this is one that I think we probably all know, um, Amanita muscaria, the fly agaric. Um, there's lots of very strange stories about this mushroom. Um, people claim that Father Christmas is inspired by the colouring of Father Christmas is inspired by the colour of this mushroom. Um, people say that, you know, in Scandinavia, um, it, people need to work out the geography because they also include Siberia in that as well, um, that Father Christmas was a shaman who would go around on Christmas Eve um, providing a fly garrick for people to be ingesting and then um, seeing reindeer flying and stuff like that. And he'd also come down the chimney. Um, I've written a couple of blog posts about that and I'll share a link to um, to my fungi page on my website if you want to see a bit more about that but that's not supposed to be um, accurate it's, it's supposed to be kind of myth um, completely a myth um, but this is seen as a um, toxic mushroom so you shouldn't ever eat this one um, you can see it's got the collar there a bit like universal veil but this is one i would expect to see from september all the way through probably to early december um, and it particularly grows with birch trees um, you may think you can only ever see fungi in the countryside but that's absolutely not the case. I've seen this fungus growing on Clapham Common, um, very near to the bandstand um, and underneath some birch trees and some long grass. So it has a, a mycorrhizal relationship. So that symbiotic relationship with silver birch. So that's that's a tree to look for. Yeah, and this is the Amanita family. So this is a scary family of mushrooms. So this is where you find the ones that are going to make you ill. Then again, I've just gone into one which you can actually, I think you can eat this one, um, but this is the blusher. So this is one that grows probably, you sometimes get this popping up in June, June or July, um, all the way through to probably into November maybe. You get this on heathlands quite often, 
Um, you also get it in sort of heathy, acidic woodlands. Um, but it's quite a common species. Um, and I would never ever, I, I wouldn't recommend anyone unless you really knew what you're doing to try and eat anything in the Amanita family because it's just too much of a risk, I'd say. Um, but then again, I'm not an expert on eating mushrooms. Um, so this is one you can find quite commonly in, uh, yeah, from, from maybe June, July, August onwards, but really September, October and November are the best times. So um, this is one that I saw for the first time last September. Probably don't need to uh, tell you what this one will do to you. Um, but this has, I think it looks quite evil. Um, it's got a kind of evil green sort of tinge to it, doesn't it? Um, but this is growing in some moss at the foot of an oak tree in the New Forest. Uh, the New Forest is, is an amazing place to find fungi. I'd really recommend going there anytime from September, October, November. It's really amazing. You can't actually pick mushrooms though, um, because it's the Forestry Commission own lots of the land and they don't allow it. Um, so, but th this is a mushroom that if you did eat it, um, you would have no reaction for about 12 hours, maybe 24 hours, um, and then you would um, you'd, you'd suffer from organ failure. Um, so it's not one that you want to eat. And I believe that this does actually, uh, this is also found in the United States, from the Northern Hemisphere. It's one that does, um, people do die from eating this, but it, I've, I've only seen this once and I've spent days looking for mushrooms. Um, I've mean, seen it a couple of times, so I don't think it's something you're gonna find regularly, but you, know, you, don't, you don't wanna be messing around with that one. Um, moving on to a different family is honey fungus, which I mentioned earlier. Um, they're ones that you grow, you find usually growing from stumps of trees. Um, again, we saw what their uh, the mycelium, the bootlaces of honey fungus can do. Um, so yeah, that, that's where you usually find them growing. I think you can actually eat these ones, but um, but I think if you have too many of them, you can get sick, and some people don't respond very well to them. Um, but this is always a signal for me that the, the mushroom season is beginning because you you get these in late August, sometimes through September and then into sort of October, November, but it, when it gets cold, they just don't fruit at all. Uh, this is them looking a bit more mature on the, on the um, upturned root plate of a tree in the new forest. And you can just see the white um, pooling on top of the, the caps, that's actually the spores. So um, these species of honey fungus, they have white spores. So this is probably the one you've all been waiting for, which is a uh, Sep, Belitus edulis is the scientific name. Um, this is one which is um, often sold, you know, at, on, at markets. Um, if people are buying wild mushrooms, um, it's very much sought after. It's the one, um, there's a lot of talk about illegal foraging gangs <laughs> um, in places like Epping Forest and stuff like that. Um, I don't know how true it is, but this is the one that people are often after. Um, it's, it's very delicious indeed, and it's much sought after. Um, you can have it raw, I think, in, in salads, but it often comes in risottos and Italian restaurants and stuff like that. Um, but I've seen it a couple of times. I've never, I've never eaten it. Um, again, this is, I'm, not, I'm just trying to give you a bit of advice about it, um, but it's just often eaten by other things. So I think the thing to bear in mind is that with mushrooms, there's usually some a slug or something that's got there before you. And this is one that you'll probably see quite commonly. Um, this grows again on fallen woods, on dead woods. Um, I've just gone with a family here. So the Latin name is Mycena um, and the mushroom, the common name is their bonnets. Um, they're, really, they're really quite cheerful things. They pop out of um, fallen wood in probably September onwards. There's quite a lot of different species and they're often just growing in groups. Um, there's some quite charismatic ones like um, saffron drop bonnets, where if you break the, the stipe, there's a little drop of saffron coloured liquid. Um, and there's also bleeding bonnet, um, which isn't as nice. Um, but I think the ones on the right are called angels bonnets, um, generally, because I think they're, they're sort of white, but they might be a different species, I'm not entirely sure. <clears throat> um, so this is a really um, iconic mushroom, um, also one that you can eat, I think, when it's young. Um, but this is shaggy ink cap. The pictures at the back there are a cemetery in London called Camberwell Old Cemetery, um, and they're growing in some uh, turf that was newly laid. Uh, you often find them growing in new turf, and I don't, I'm not sure why that is. I don't know if they've managed to kind of find a niche in the market and they've stocked themselves into all the kind of new turf that you can buy. Um, but they go through this amazing process of deliquescence. So you can see the ink dripping through. That's where the name, that's where they get the name ink cap from, obviously. Um, but it's called a state of deliquesce. 
And that's really how they're producing their spores because um, it all comes through the, the breaking down of the cap and then the liquid that drips through and they start to look like they've sort of shriveled away. And that's a picture of them at the bottom when they're a bit younger. And they also get the name of a lawyer's wig because they look like a lawyer's wig. Um, this is the one that was found that I found at Clapham Junction, a fairy ink cap growing in a woodland on the North Downs um, in Surrey, sort of Surrey London border. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and these grow in profusion um, after there's been a downpour. I think this was probably in October, um, but you do you do also get them growing um, in the summer months. I've seen them growing, I think in <coughs> excuse me in June as well. So I think if there's any rain, they just kind of pop up and they appear and then they go again sometimes within 12 hours. Um, so they're very sort of elliptical species. Um, and again, they don't respond too well to, to too, too dry a period or too, um, too cold a period. Um, another common um, ink cap is the glistening ink cap. You see it's got these sort of speckles on, on the cap there. And they're another one that bursts through um, after, after some rain as well. Um, another ink cap, ink cap's a great family of mushrooms, really, really interesting one to get into. Um, they, go, they also go through, go through a state of deliquesce. Um, and they, they also start to break down as well over time. Oh, I think someone's just unmuted. There we go, sorry. Um, so this is, um, I did say that it's not, very, it's not very easy to find a mushroom that's gonna make you ill, um, but this is one of the most common mushrooms that you can find. It's called sulfur tuft. Um, Hyphaloma is the scientific family name. Um, and this is actually a poisonous mushroom, um, but you know, it's not, you can't get ill from like touching them or looking at them. So I wouldn't worry too much about that or listening to them, hearing what they've got to say or inhaling their spores. Um, but they grow really commonly. I've seen these growing out of the um, next to the pavement in London. Um, they grow on fallen deadwood. They're really common species. So that's one that you should have on your list of first ones to see, I'd say. Um, <clears throat> I do believe they also glow in the dark. Um, and so that's called bioluminescence. And there's very few species in the world that do that, but this is one of them. So I need to try and find some um, sulfur tuft in the nighttime and get a torch and um, see what happens with them. I don't know if a torch would do it, something to make them glow, that would be pretty cool. Um, this is one that if you're someone who's here for culinary reasons or looking to forage and to eat, um, it's one you may know about. So this is the parasol mushroom. Um, this is quite a large, large mushroom. The cap, I've seen a cap that's probably about this big, I don't know if Zoom can go, it does very well with scale because my hands look huge and my head looks tiny, um, but they can probably grow to about 60 centimeters across, so really big, um, but they they grow in the sort of, maybe the summer months and then through to, um, before it gets too cold in the UK's Southern England, usually kind of end of November nowadays. Um, but they're close relatives of shaggy parasol. So um, Bell House is in Dulwich and the picture on the left is taken in Dulwich Park. Um, and that's a shaggy parasol and you kind of, that, that's what it looks like when the cat begins to, to move out. This one I think is, um, is not edible. Um, common puffball, this is a, a nice one to find. The picture on the left was taken in Dulwich as well. Um, the only picture on here that I think that isn't one of mine is actually, I haven't taken this photo yet, um, is I think, I don't know if this is in India maybe, um, but this is a puffball shooting out those spores um, this isn't a spore shooter though, that's a different group of, of mushrooms. It's still a kind of typical mushroom um, type basidiomycete. Um, but th these are much sought after, I think, because um, you can eat them. Um, but they grow in places where like dogs go to the toilet and stuff and, and sometimes stuff gets spilled down the side of a path maybe. Like, you, you, I don't know if you want to eat what's down there. Um, but they grow often alongside pathways, but also they grow in woodland areas, also grow on deadwood. There's quite a lot of different types of puffballs. But if you see them in their kind of leathery later stages, if you step on them, they produce spores um, that will go out into the air, as you can see here. Um, this is another large group of mushrooms that we get in the UK and you get across, um, across Europe and the Northern Hemisphere as well. And they're the, the brittle gills, the, uh, the scientific name is Russula. Um, I've got this picture because they're really beautiful, but they often just look like this. They've been chewed down or eaten by some kind of animal. Uh, in um, Sydenham Hillwood in Dulwich in South London, I saw a grey squirrel pick one of these, turn it upside down and spin the, the stem round and chew down the gills. So they're obviously used to doing that um, in America. 
um, with the same kind of species. But I was quite impressed by that squirrel's ability to eat that mushroom. But um, usually slugs and things get there before people would. Um, it's difficult to identify these mushrooms. I don't even bother most of the time. Some of them are not very good for you and some of them you can eat. So if you're looking for culinary reasons, I'd, I'd look somewhere else. Um, I mentioned the wax caps earlier in cemeteries, um, but they're ones that again grow in ancient grassland. This is a really uh, beautiful one. This is a scarlet wax cap. Uh, this is near where I live actually in a little cemetery. Uh, no, it makes it sound like I live in a little cemetery. This is near where I live just down the road. Um, and these were growing, they kind of grow in October time, but you also get them in September as well. Um, and they, if you ever see these, I'd recommend reporting them to your local uh, record center, which you could usually find by um, searching for the Wildlife Trust online or something, because people want to know where these are still, still are uh, living so they can conserve them. Um, very well known group of um, mushrooms because they're so delicious. Um, I don't know if I've ever had these chanterelles before, like, you know, you can just buy them in the shops and stuff or Italian restaurants and things like that. Um, but on the left hand, we've got the common sort of chanterelle, um, which I didn't pick that, that was found uh, lying on the ground in Scotland. Scotland's good for chanterelles. Um, and on the right is a Sussex heathland, and that is trumpet chanterelle growing in, I think, December, actually. They do grow late into the winter, um, but I was delighted to find those. I just, I just sort of, you know, find joy in these things popping up and trying to understand what they are but they're just so beautiful as well. That's, that's what I really enjoy about mushrooms. Um, so another common group of fungi are the deceivers. Um, so the Latin name is Lacaria. Um, so you've got the deceiver there on the left-hand side and on the right-hand side is amethyst deceiver. Um, and these do grow in urban areas as well, but they're usually growing in grasslands and woodlands. You can't really ever get over this fungus. This is a stink horn. Um, it really does smell like, um, I think it, it smells like a rotten fox is the closest thing I could describe it as. Uh, this was in August in Suffolk last year, um, but all those beetles are enjoying something growing on it. Um, but it appears from an egg that looks like an eye in the ground, um, but it's absolutely amazing fungus, you know, it's really bizarre. Um, going, just quickly going through some of the brackets, this is turkey tail um, taken in Sydenham Hill Wood in Dulwich. So this is a this is a really common species the world over. It's thought to have anti-cancer pro properties, so people actually take extracts of it. There's a bit more about that in that fantastic fungi film. Um, but this is a, I think you can make tea from it if you dry it and it could be quite, quite good for you. Um, Chicken of the Woods we talked about, you know, if you see that this time of year, this was in May about five or six years ago. I think it was five years ago. You cannot miss it when you see that. That's on an, a fallen oak tree. This is what it looks when it's starting to kind of big, when it's just starting to come through again on an oak tree. And there's the, the finished product as well, my friend's hand for, for scale. Um, these are the artists and southern bracket sort of ones that you get. You get that's growing on a beech tree. These often decay the roots of a tree and kind of can um, mess with the structure of a tree, but really common um, part of the woodland. They can get to be quite big. So I've got my hand here look, looking a bit like a burglar um, and some deceivers for scale. That is an absolutely huge um, fungus. I think they probably fuse together um, great name, Weeping Conch. Um, if you look at this one closely, this is in August, September time when they come out, um, but they, they take on too much water. They're usually on oak trees, sometimes on beech trees, but it takes on too much water and it has to release it through its pores, which gets this amazing effect, which is called um, guttation, I think. This is one that's fruiting right now. I've seen some pictures on iNaturalist and um, also on social media of dryad saddle. So a dryad is a wood nymph. Um, and so it's said that a wood nymph would sit on this fungus perhaps. Um, but the picture on the left is what it looks like when it's first fruiting. And the one on the right is when it's a bit more mature. But this is May and June is the prime time for this fungus. Um, one that you'll see absolutely everywhere. This is a very common urban fungus. This is jelly ear. Um, it usually grows on elder. Um, that's one you see really quite commonly. Um, so yeah, you wanna look for elder trees really common in London's woodlands, particularly London's newest sort of um, recent growth woodlands. Um, moving to the cup fungi, here you've got scarlet elf cup, which I mentioned earlier. I took these photos in uh, December or January, I can't remember. Um, absolutely stunning mushroom, um, very much sought after in Russia. They gather loads of them because um, they're edible as well, but they're just beautiful to look at, I think. They often grow in dead hedges in woodlands or in damp places. 
And just to finish, um, slime molds, I mentioned them earlier, they're not actually fungi, probably not that closely related to fungi. Uh, this is on a, the woodland, a woodland floor in the Sussex Low Weald. Um, and this is, I'm not sure the name of this one, but you can see it's spreading out and it's going and kind of eating or eating, sort of breaking down and drawing minerals from, from the decaying leaf litter. Shows you how important leaf litter is. And this is one that I found um, in, again, in another Sussex Will Woodland recently, really beautiful. Um, so really something to look out for, but very, very small indeed. But yeah, that's me. Thank you for listening and for coming along. And I'm gonna pass over to Lucinda. <laughs>